a long day, and so I'm going to make this kind of brief, even though uh, pretty much mainly because I left most of my notes at home, so I'll jot down a few things before I got here. This week. Um, I just want to talk about the Mohican language, and uh, Mohican language always considered the, the end dialect of the Banaque language. Uh, we, we will use L's, R's, F's, B's within our language. Uh, within the, the Lenape, we have a word with the, um, the special one of the groups, drum groups out there. How we call Lenape is Nanapoi, that's how we call that. And then uh, within that uh, respect to that language and that dialect is how what we call that group at the time. Uh, language, when you think of what is language, you know, it's, uh, it, it's words, gestures, utterances to each other to, uh, to get an idea of what to pass on ideas and thoughts from one person to another. And I've been taught when I was younger that uh, our ancestors have always left things on a path for us to find. And when we come across these things, it's up to us to pick those things up and utilize them. So if we don't utilize those things and we walk down the path a little bit further and we turn around, those things may be gone and gone forever. And I consider language as one of those things that's been left on the path and it's very evident in a lot of the manuscripts and documents that have been put down for the last 400 years from, for all of our people, that have been written down in, in, in from missionary uh, statements to uh, land deeds and all kinds of, it's all over the place. Growing up, I never knew that there was any Mohican, Muncie language, any kind of language that was considered ours. I never thought there was anything, just a few words, names of a few streets that we live on or back home and such, I was pretty disappointed. And I'm glad to have my mentor, my first language teacher, Molly Miller here, uh, taught me my first Stockbridge words ever. You know, I still have some of the original sheets from what seems like 200 years ago we were doing the classes. I'm just <laughs> old. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's been growing a lot. Uh, I like to look at things in a more spiritual way side of things, and I know many of you have understood the, the prophecy of the white buffalo from when it was born and how many of these things are coming back to our people, and I've seen that within our community, language and culture, and it just seems to be exploding, and to be proud to be Native American, where some of our elders remember a time that they weren't proud, and they still feel a little funny, some of them going to powwows and such, just because they were made to feel so bad about language and culture and dancing and such like that from a long time ago. And it was very sad for me to see that because we always grew up wanting those things, you know, wishing we could have them. Now, in an example on how these things have been set on a path are, like I said, are these words, these letters, these uh, land deeds that have been written for a long, long, long time, for the last few hundred years. The only problem is, is that these were written by nine tribal linguists, is how they were written. And the problem with it is that it, you open these books up, or these manuscripts up, and, and, it, and it looks completely like gibberish. You know, how they write it down, how they tell you, you know, you're supposed to learn this language, and the right, the, pr the proper pronunciations and such. But I've noticed that I've, I've looked at at least four or five different linguists' interpretations of our language, and there's four or five different interpretations on how they spell it, how they write it, and how they pronounce it. And they would tell us for, for all these years that our language is dead, that the Mohican language is dead, and that we have no, no need to bother learning that language. We should go on and learn something else that's more useful. And I've heard that from one of the linguists that was putting together some of our language. I won't mention this. It's kind of an insult to me and to my to my people, to our all people, that they tell you that your language is dead. I went to a Algonquin language seminar probably about six years ago in the Peacock Reservation, and I listened to uh, a woman, Jessie Little, uh, her, her Jessie Little, I forget her, her real last name, but uh, she made something a point that was really, that really struck true to me, and she said. If one word exists in your language, your language is not dead. And I really took that to heart because we have words such as Quinamunta, uh, which is actually uh, an evolved word of Kunamatse, Kulamalse, 
from uh, Lenape language, which is Quinamantha uh, is actually the evolved Mohican version of that word. Um, we have words like Mohican, uh, people of the waters that are never still. Uh, we have Mohican Road right up on our reservation. We have words. We have words that we don't understand that we've been told that as children. I, some of you I mentioned those words uh, a few years ago at the last gathering, such as uh, Kacha. Kachiwagi, <laughs> which we call these, which we call little kids, you know. The, uh, I, I, the only thing that I, I've ever heard that really translated over to is kind of like how we call them, like a little like a kid, like a little a little piss hand or something like that, you know, just a little playful child, you know. So we call them kachak and kachiwagi. Um, I really look at the language when it was set aside, you know, by these linguists, you know, and by our people. The people knew that it was this disappearing, and that the interest was fake. And so they knew that they had to put it down in something. And within Moravian missions and the missions at Stockbridge, they started putting some of these words down. And some of these uh, linguists started putting these words down as well. And basically what it all is, is if you look at a flower that casts seeds, the language is seeds and they've been lying dormant for many, many, many years. Now when the flower casts its seeds and the seeds sprout, it's not the same flower. Basically, what it is, it's hope and it's promise of renewal of what happened, what came from before. And that's what I look at this language, the Mohican language, is that a seed right now. And in order for them seeds to sprout and to bloom and to flourish, you need fertile ground. And that's one of the problems that we have within communities is, uh, you know, people, they want to learn words here or there, but they don't want to learn, learn the language. There's not a whole lot of people who want to get down to the nitty gritty and learn, you know, the inside and out. They just want to say, well, I just say hello. Or, you know, that's that's nice, you know. But for those of us who really are deep, digging deep into the language and trying to find as much as we can, that's just not good enough. It's just not good enough to say hello, goodbye, how you doing? You know, you guys say, well, why do you say this? How do you say that? Um, one of the things uh, Molly would tell us that. Uh, some things that you can say in Native American language, it's only funny in Native American language. But if you look at it through the English language, it's not funny, you don't understand it. And it's, it's, it really remains true. And I, I ask myself, kind of like how Bruce was saying, like, oh, what am I doing here? You know, I'm, I don't have any degrees. I don't have any credentials. I don't have the higher education. I'm usually like one of the guys that are always seated along the highway digging a ditch, you know, but I love language. I love Native American language. It's always been something that's really been a burning passion of mine to know who I am. Well, what is language? Language is, tells you who you are, it tells you where you've been, it tells you where you're going. And then above all, it also tells you who your relationship, your relationship is at. I remember coming either, you go to Palo House, I came here to, a couple years ago for the last gathering, I had gone to the Algonquin uh, conference, and I listened to people talk different nations, different people, and I hear a lot of our words within their language. And I said, these are my people. These are my brothers, these are my sisters, these are my cousins, all these people I can tell within their language who I am related to. So language is it's just not saying hello and goodbye to each other. It tells you a whole lot more about yourself and your people and where you're going. And we have to be careful with our language and where we're going. I, there was a lot that I had planned. I, I sat on the language and culture board for about six years and try and figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to get this language together? Some of us just wanted to throw all words together and publish a book and get it done, but I, I knew it wasn't right at that time. The timing wasn't right. It wasn't time to plant those seeds. The ground was fertile, but we didn't have the right water. And I knew there was a lot of mistakes. Even reading through a lot of the old manuscripts and such of the Mohican language, I can see a lot of mistakes that the linguists put down there whether it's a, a mistake where somebody's talking in first or second person and it's written down in third person, third person plural, animates, inanimates, all that kind of stuff. You know, and you see a lot of mistakes that they didn't understand. They were just writing things down or whatever they were being told. Um, as I said, you know, the, uh, the obstacles are you know, the lack of interest, the lack of uh, cooperation. The, uh, I'll take that back. Not really the lack of interest. There is interest, but there's just a lack of interest in trying to get the job done. You know, and the linguists that tell you that tell us that our language is dead, and I, I do not believe that. 
language is like that. I mean, you can look at it as uh, almost flatlining, you know, kind of like a heartbeat monitor, but it's not that. I'm not that. My children aren't dead, our nations are not dead. We don't have a dead language. It's very, very, very low on that scale. But, like as she said, if one word exists, you'd not hear the language is not dead. And I believe that. I believe that to the, my heart. And if I thought it was true, I would have gave up on this stuff probably six, seven years ago before I started that. But I, all I wanted to do at that time was to say, hello, how you doing? Goodbye, good night, are you hungry? Are you sick? Are you feeling, how are you feeling today? You know, just real small, small talk. But the further I got deeper into it, the more I wanted to bring it more on. The problem with the language of Mohican language is it's not complete, it never will be complete. There's so much missing from it. And that was one of the things that kind of deterred me also, is like, I can't put forth the language. I can't help out, I can't do anything with this. And I got tired of really listening to what other people were telling me I can't do because I started to tell myself what I can't do as well. But I got the idea maybe two years ago or so that I'm not going to listen to people tell me what I can't do. I ain't going to listen to people telling me that I'm dead or that my people are dead or our ways are dead or I should just go learn Menominee or Ojibwe or some other language that is being spoken for me because that's not our people's language. Any kind of language that would be, I mean, whether you're looking at another Algonquin language or if you're looking at uh, uh, Spanish or English or anything else other than our people's language just wasn't going to be different. I had to find out our people's language. We talked about talking with the ancestors. How did the ancestors say this? How did they go about their ceremonies? How do our elders, what do our elders think? What do our children think? Children think? What does everybody think? We go out to the community and we talk to them one another thing. Some of the elders say, ah, I'm too old to learn that stuff anyway. You know, it doesn't matter or whatever. Some of them just want to know how you say hello or goodbye. Some of the kids, they kind of want to say that, say the same thing. I want to say hello, goodbye, or whatever, but they don't want to sit in a classroom all day learning stuff, you know, because that's just not how we as Native Americans learn. We're out in the field. We're out walking around, looking at things, pointing at things, talking how things go. We don't sit in a classroom all day long and while well, we're at school, we do, but we all know how bad that can turn out. And we're Native Americans. We have our language. We put it down. Our ancestors knew that it was fading. And they had to write it down. They had to have linguists come and write it down. <coughs> They put it away, they put it on that path, and they had a hope that one day somebody will come along and pick this up again. That somebody will pick it up and have an interest because they looked around at that time and the interest was fading, mainly through missions and, and the, uh, the Christian era and such. And it, uh, to speak Native American was to be a heathen, you know, so it wasn't popular. But they had hoped one day that by putting it down, somebody's going to pick it up one day and carry on with it. And I felt that I was one of them people that came across it. I came across some of these things. I came across a lot of obstacles. And it almost put me down to where I just didn't want to do it anymore. And I had to think to myself, you know what? I'm not dead. My family's not dead. This language has been put down. Now, who are we going to trust to bring it back forth again? A lot of books have been written by linguists, non Native American, non. Uh, Not Native American people, and if you can't think Native American, and I don't mean any disrespect to anyone here who's non Native linguists here, but if you don't think Native American, there's a lot of things you're not going to understand. And with uh, several linguists who have written sort of short stories, um, I don't know what you call them, manuscripts or whatever in our language, they're all so much different, and none of them agree with each other. And that's one of the things that I was told at that conference is that you can't do this like these non-native, non-tribal people, not, not even just non-native, but non-tribal people outside of your own side, bring back your language because then it's not true. Your own people have to bring their language back. If we don't bring that language back and put it all off to linguists and just say, here, do it up for us, that's no longer our language. It comes their language. And our language is there if it doesn't come back from our people. My plans, since um, I have two autistic daughters, I'm a stay-at-home dad, I have uh, an online business in which I take care of, so I, I, 
I know it's just an excuse, but I don't have a whole lot of time for a little push right now. But one of the things that I've been outlining right now is a book. I figure to myself, you know, if I'm not that person, if I'm not one of these first people that can plant these seeds and get them growing good, I'm going to put my, my little bit of part into it. The only thing I can do is figure is I'm going to write a book. I'm writing this book as observation of, of the Mohican language through the eyes of a Mohican Indian, through a Stockbridge Institute of Mohican Indian. It would be the first book written by our own people, of course, with uh, the uh, observation of Mali and Celtic Mali and the language and culture work. But it would be the first bit book written by our people, from our people, for our people, and all the things that we need to put down. A lot of these linguists, when they write it down, we don't understand it. I mean, every, all your every average, sorry, average everyday people who want to open up a book and learn things, and they open up these books and it's a linguist book, and they're speaking English, but they have no idea what the heck they're talking about. You know, with the neuter verbs, on first, second, third person, uh, animates, inanimates, and such like that, and conjugations, and things, and it really turns a lot of people off. We have to figure out a way, how can we make this so it's interesting and very user friendly so people don't get turned off, so they don't look at it and like it's just some big uh, uh, computer repair manual or something like that. Because a lot of people don't like the, the, the all the jumbled, uh, sorry, I'm trying to figure out the words that, uh, all the big words that people use, that the linguists use. And I have to admit that I have a lot of hard time understanding that as well. Like I said, I'm not somebody with degrees. I'm not somebody with a higher education. I'm just an average person who wanted to learn a language and I have a passion for the language. I want to learn our language, my language, the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican language, whatever we're going to learn on our reservation and how our our, land, our ancestors spoke, how we pray to my ancestors. I want to pray to my ancestors. I want to walk down the street and I want to say hello, goodbye, how you doing people and carry on conversation with our own people. And Leaving, and like I said, I mean, no disrespect to anybody who might be a linguist in the room, is that it, we leave it up to many linguists that tell us that our language is dead and that we should just move on to another language. And I don't believe that. I'm not dead. My children aren't dead. I have these seeds. And even if I can't move on and sprout these up myself, I'm going to do my part. Because when you look at all of these, we got hundreds and hundreds of different works with the Mohican language. I look to condense a lot of it or make it more of a, a user-friendly guide to all of those works that are out there to help our people that they can open up and just say, okay, we're going to discuss, you know, short things. Uh, we'll go with like uh, children's coloring books or um, just um, small talk, you know, greetings, um, just things you can see around the house, see around how you go outside and things like the trees, the, the, the sky, the grass, the, the earth. Cars. We need to make up words for cars. We have no word for car in Native America. What are we going to do? I don't know. I and mean, like we're getting back to like what we were saying before, I don't really know why I'm here today. You know, and I'm looking, I guess, for support, maybe. Um, looking for ideas, you know, what, I can do, what we can do. Um, and even if I get those ideas and support, I have to, uh, to implement them. Because, like I said, I leave here, I'm going to go back to, you know, digging my ditches again. And this is going to have to be something that will be put up to highly educated people within our tribe that can handle this kind of workload and it's going to take you. And that's one thing I didn't want to do, is that we could have just went and just wrote out a whole bunch of things, made a small dictionary, but I knew it wasn't going to be right. It wasn't going to be correct. The spelling wouldn't be right. The, the, Conjugations probably wouldn't be all right. The pronunciations probably weren't going to be all right. So I guess it was just kind of sitting on my hands and waiting, waiting for the right time to understand, okay, how am I really going to do this? Because if I do it and we do it wrong, it's just going to be as, as, uh, as all jumbled and, and, and horribly written as you know, the dictionaries that the linguists have written for us. We have a book that's called, uh, written by Carol Mastin. It's a Mohican language dictionary. And most of the people that I talked to who have read it said they just don't understand it. 
that's written by a linguist. And with all the linguistical terms that he uses and uh, references, referencing back and forth from Algonquin to Crow Algonquin and other Native American tribes and such, it, it just sends you through a maze of confusion. And that's something that we can't have. That's something our elders don't want to look at. That's something our children don't want to look at. Now, if you're, if you're a linguist or you really good with uh, linguistical terms, you can understand it a little bit, but most people on our reservation aren't, so that book doesn't get written very often. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, language revitalization for the, the Muncie language, which is going really good and going really great, but I also, there were a tribe that has several um, mixed Native Americans, but the main body is Stockbridge Muncie, the Stockbridge Indians are the, Mohic, or the left remnants of the Mohican and Lane. Lane uh, nation. And I really feel that it's important not only for one language but for the other language so everyone has a choice to understand whatever they want to learn, however they want to do that. And who knows, maybe 20, 30 years that language is all going to be wrapped into one and that will be that Stockbridge Muncie and the Mohican language. Um, I don't want to put too much on my shoulders because I know I can't do it. I can't do it all myself. I want to be able to live my life and be able to pray in my language, talk to people, but the problem is, is that I just don't have the time to do that. And for, there are talks of other people who want to try to pick up where I left off, but there's some works going on today that are people are trying to put certain packets together and stuff, but it's, it's just as confusing as the old stuff. And it's, in my eyes, it's just not very worked out for the Mohican language. Um, and another thing is people aren't coming together. They're, they're banding off and doing it all on their own, you know, all over. And some of them are in Michigan, some of them are on our reservation, some of them are down in Green Bay, a little ways down the road, and but they're not all coming together. As a people, if this is ever going to come back together, if we're going to unfreeze these words out of those manuscripts and books, we all need to come back together. Otherwise, what I've learned on my own, and what I start to pray, and how I start to speak, that's only my dialogue, because that's what I'm doing. And i got to go out to the rest of the people and say, well, how would you say this? How would you say this? How can we all say this so we understand each other? Now, I got hung up on saying people saying, well, that's not the original way of how you were supposed to, how people said it back in the day. Okay, well, well how would we say it? Well, we don't know. It's written down, but we can't understand on what kind of orthography was, it was written in, whether it was English or German or however these people uh, whoever wrote it down, but their mindset of how they write down their, their penmanship, or not penmanship, but uh, writing the properties. And so I decided as well, well, to me, on my own self, I'm thinking, well, if we put out a word, you know, that's written down, we have no pronunciation, and we can't go to our brothers and sisters, our cousin tribes, and find out what kind of pronunciation it is, we all have to get together in a group and decide how to say that word. Okay, and I know, our, I know our ancestors and our spirit guys, they're all in that room understanding and listening to us and we come in agreement on that word, they're all going to know what we mean when we use that word. So if I say a word to you that is a little bit different, say how it was spoken three, four hundred years ago, as long as you understand what I'm saying, that's language, it's communication, it's talking to one another, transferring those ideas and thoughts from one person to another. And so that's one of the... the obstacles that I, I feel that I've gotten over, and I'm hoping that this book is going to help out. This book that is just basically, I'm going to write it in basically like a children's kind of book. So it's so simple, so easy, leave out all the big linguistical terms and such, and, but the language isn't complete, and hopefully maybe 20, 30 years down the road somebody can pick up and go on with the whole rest of that business. I really don't have the shoulders for it. Uh, like I said, I have two autistic daughters, I have an at-home business that I take care of, and I've almost dropped off the face of the earth of the language uh, ship there, you know, and, but it's still a burning desire in my heart, and I wonder, you know, why am I here, what am I going to do, you know, what, what's this purpose going to have, you know, but, you know, I, I, and I got thinking about it, and I listened to some of you guys speak, you know, and talking about the spirituality of it all, and our elders, and our children, and families, and that reminds me of why I am here. It's for the spirituality, for our elders, our ancestors, our, our families, our nations, why we need to keep this going. Because if we do let it go, if we do pass down that path, 
and not pick up those things that our ancestors put on the end of that path for us, it will be gone. And we will be dead. We will be dead as a people. If we don't pick those things up, the language, the culture, the ceremonies. Uh, we're in a very, very special time. The way Buffalo came and all these things are coming back to our people. There's, um, I also got right here, don't ramble, stick to the point. So. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I can ramble and go off on different things, but it, we're in a very, very interesting time. Very interesting time. And it's very important that we don't pass these things up on that path, that we pick them up and that we lose them. I know I get lazy sometimes and I, I, I make up all kinds of excuses why I shouldn't do this or why I shouldn't do that or why I should let somebody else do it. But for some reason I feel that these seeds were dropped in my life and I have to do something with it. Exactly what? I still don't know. And I don't want this book. This, starting off this book is going to be a start. And wherever it goes from there, I don't know whether I'm working with it or somebody else picks it up down the road and they're able to sift through all this maze of BS that was written so long ago. Maybe I can did, do my part in it. And I've helped out a little bit. And maybe them spirits will leave me alone and drag me back to places like this to <laughs> figure out what the heck am I going to do with this. Because I, I'm the probably have the least amount of education in the So I often, I mean, I, I sort of heard uh, people like Shelly who teaches uh, classes, uh, this young fella here who's in college learning a lot through the, the courses and such, and you know, I'm very, um, I feel very small, I guess, you know, in this room. You know, because there's so much education, there's so much people done so much, and I kind of feel like I haven't done enough, you know, within my community, with for my people, and I guess uh, I'm just going to keep trying. I'm going to keep doing what I have been doing. I'm not dead. I have these seeds to share with my people. I'm not going to pass it up on that road. You know, my people aren't dead. My family is not dead. You know, my elders, our children, our families, our ceremonies, they all need these things. Okay, and if we're ever going to remember where we came from, who we are, where we're going, and who our relatives are, we have to keep up with this language, all of us. So I'm going to stop rambling right there, and uh, I don't know if you have guys any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I had my original notes, and I gave a much better speech. <laughs>